Well, praise the Lord, Pastor Michael Jakes, and welcome to the Wednesday night Cutting It Right Bible study. Once again, coming to you with a word for your heart and for your soul. We pray that all is well with you tonight. We are streaming right now live over Facebook and YouTube and Periscope and Twitter. And we pray that as you join us, that you will, if you're joining, if you're joining us on Facebook, we pray you'll take the time out uh, to share this page, uh, that others also may be blessed. If you happen to be watching over Periscope uh, or Twitter, uh, we also pray that you'll take the time out to retweet uh, this page, that others also may be blessed. Amen. You can also visit our website at that's the word.org. Uh, and you can also go to our YouTube channel. Uh, which is That's the Word Ministries, and you can just uh, go to Pastor Michael Jakes, and that'll bring you right there, and you can subscribe while you're there. We pray if you haven't done so already. Uh, just another word about our website. Our new website will be rolling out very shortly, uh, and when it does, we will let you know. Amen? And so we just honor the Lord, and we bless him, and we thank him uh, for what he is doing in our midst. Now, tonight, Tonight, we are beginning a brand new series, a brand new series entitled Living the Life, Discovering the Keys to Living for Christ. Amen. Uh, how we live for Christ, just what this Christian life is all about. That's what we will be dealing with uh, in this multi-part series. So we pray that you will be with us uh, for the next several weeks as we open up the word of God. Amen. Uh, study to show thyself, approve unto God, a workman that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that's what we intend to do uh, in our studies. Amen. And so we just honor the Lord and we bless him and we thank him for all uh, that he is doing in our midst. Now we're going to pray and we're going to get right into our study for tonight. Amen. Lord, we bless your name. We thank you once again for giving us this opportunity. And Lord, we pray for the next few minutes, Lord, as we explore the riches of this glorious life that you have given us. Uh, Lord, we pray that you will give us clarity of speech, clarity of mind. Lord, we pray you will anoint this word as it goes out. And Lord, I pray it will reach out to those who need to hear this word. And Lord, I pray you will draw those uh, in to this particular study. Uh, even tonight, Lord Jesus, whether it be live or Lord, whether it be on a replay, Lord, I pray that you will draw those who need to hear this word. So Lord, have your way. Bless us together right now in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So we bless the Lord and we honor him for everything uh, that he is doing. Amen. Now, when we talk about when we talk about living, living for Christ, just exactly was that what does that mean? Living for Christ, the Christian life. Just what does it comprise of? What, what is it all about? Uh, we hear about it all the time. I'm living for Jesus. I'm living for Christ. I'm living for the Lord. Just exactly what does it mean to live for the Lord? Amen. Uh, Christianity means different things to different people. Uh, if you would take a poll, if you would do interviews, you would you would find out that not everyone has the uh, very same ideas and thoughts concerning what Christianity is. And that goes for those who are in the body and those, of course, who are outside of the body, okay? And so it's very important uh, that as we are serving Christ, that we know just what we are doing and how to go about doing it. Uh, some people are simply serving uh, a grand thought, a grand idea, a great concept. That's where some people come down when it comes to their serving God. They are serving a concept, maybe something that they've done uh, since they've been young, or maybe they were raised up in it, but they really don't have relationship. And that's what uh, the Christian life is all about. It is about having a relationship with the creator of the universe. Amen. And so in our study tonight, we seek to establish what this life is all about. Now, we will not be exhaustive because I do not believe we can ever exhaust just what the Christian life is all about. Uh, it is too glorious. It is too grand uh, for us to even put into human words all that this Christian life is. And I don't think until we get to glory, then we will understand fully just what it means to serve God. I really don't think that we really get it, if I can use that phrase. I don't think we get it yet. Uh, we know uh, that God is mighty. We know that God is good. Uh, we have all the catchphrases that we need, uh, but 
What does it mean to really serve him? And what is this life all about? Amen. That's what we want to look at tonight in our first lesson. And this lesson, I've entitled it The First Step. The first step. Now, when we talk about the first step in living the Christian life, the first step is really a series. The first step of living the Christian life, living uh, living the Christian life, is a series of truths that will help you and enhance, even empower you to live for the Lord in a greater way. Even before we get into the nuts and bolts about how to live for the Lord, we need to know what the life is all about. People go to church, people pray, people sing, people fast, people do all these things. And all of those things are absolutely wonderful. They are good. They are great. But what is it all about? Some people just do those things to do those things. Others, it it means something else. But what does it mean to live the Christian life? What is it? The first thing, and this is number one, The rest are not in any particular order. And we've come up with eight things that we believe that are the major essential qualities of the Christian life. Like I said, number one here is the first because without this, everything else pales in comparison. Without this first one, it doesn't matter what else happens because if we don't have number one right, then we will possibly have all the others wrong. Number one, we're talking about the first step in living the Christian life. The first step in before you even know how to do it. It is, this Christian life is a faith life. It is a faith life. Now, why do I call this the most important one? Because where you place your faith, will determine how the rest of your Christian life goes, where you place your faith. Now, if you are placing your faith in your works, in you are, if you are placing your faith in your deeds, if you are placing your faith in the things that you do, if you are placing your faith in how much you pray, how much you go to church, uh, how much you read your Bible, if you are praying, if you are placing your faith in all of those things, then your faith is faulty. All of those things are good, as we said earlier. It is good to pray. It is good to read. It is good to fast. It is good to do all of these Christian disciplines. And we all should do them and do them uh, uh, much. But if you place your faith in the doing of those things, you will fall into problems. So where does your faith go? If I don't put my faith in what I do, then where do I put my faith? You put your faith in the one who saved you. And that is Jesus Christ. What he did on the cross, he died on the cross to give you victory. If it were not for his victory, everything that we do means nothing. We are of all men most miserable. If Christ did not die on the cross, he abolished the power of the devil. Satan has no more power over the child of God. Oh, no, he does it. He does it. It it would seem that he does if you don't understand just exactly who the devil is and understand what his uh, uh, what his uh, course of actions are, then it will seem as if he has an upper hand. But Satan does not have the upper hand. He is not victorious. Jesus was victorious. And because Jesus was victorious, that means that I am presently victorious. Right now, right, at, right now, as you watch, as you listen, you are victorious because Jesus was and remains victorious. Here's what we read, and we're going to start. We're going to read pretty much a lot of scripture tonight, but in Galatians chapter 2, verse number 20, this is the hallmark. Galatians 2.20 is the hallmark about how to live for Christ. Galatians chapter 2, verse number 20, once again, I am crucified with Christ. In other words, what that scripture is saying, and it is saying something maybe that you haven't heard or maybe you haven't understood it. Maybe you haven't read these words uh, in a very careful way, but here's what that first statement means. I am crucified with Christ. What it means is that when Christ died, you died. Now, we're not talking about physically, but when Christ died, you died. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. In spite of that, hey, here I am. I am alive. 
Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Christ lives in me. This is what happens when you become born again. You become that new creature in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 17. So because I am a new creation or a new creature in Christ, this, that is because Christ now lives in me. Continuing in verse number 20 of Galatians chapter 2. And the life, your present life right now, the life which I now live in the flesh, in my body, in this world, walking and talking every day, the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by or through the faith in or of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This verse establishes the fact that your faith, your faith, your life in Christ should be lived through faith in what Christ did for you on the cross. Now, we're going to bring this up several times in our series because, once again, this is the hallmark. This is the benchmark scripture when we talk about how to live for Jesus Christ. It is by faith in the one who saved you because of who he is and what he has done. What did he do? Die, victoriously die. So he loved me and gave himself for me. We go to uh, second Corinthians in second Corinthians uh, chapter number five and verse number seven, second Corinthians chapter number five and verse number seven. Let me find that real quick. Second Corinthians five, seven. We're talking about faith. This is a faith life it says here for we walk for we walk by faith. Our walk, our life in Christ is by faith. We don't live by sight. We don't, we don't go by the things that we see. We go by faith. We live by faith. If we, once we understand that, nothing the devil can do to us will have any power over us. If we can remember those words, here we go, here we go back to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, verse number 18, piggybacking on 2 Corinthians 5, 7. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. This is done by faith. You have to do this by faith. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The only way that you can look at things that you cannot see Understand what he says here. The only way that you can look at things that you cannot see and, and, and see the things that you cannot see. I know that sounds crazy, but that's exactly what this verse says. In order to do this, it's by faith. That's what he means when he says in 5-7, we walk by faith and not by sight. So this life in Christ is first and foremost, it establishes everything else. It is a faith walk, completely. For we have been saved. Let's go to Ephesians. Let's go to Ephesians chapter number two and verse number eight. Ephesians chapter number two and verse number eight. Very familiar portion of scripture. For by grace are ye saved through what? Faith. It is by faith that you are saved. Through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it is by faith. Faith. That's how we get in and that's how we remain in by placing our faith in Christ and what he has done. Moving on. The Christian life, the Christian life is not only a faith life, the Christian life is a forward life. It is a forward life. What do we mean by that? There is no backing up. There is no standing still. There is, see, when you stand still, we're not talking about what scripture says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. That simply means hold your place. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord means don't move, stay right where you are and watch what God is going to do. But the same, but in the same way, we are to move forward, 
forward is the direction that God always moves. Uh, we read uh, from Philippians, Philippians chapter number three and verse number 12, starting in verse number 12. Here's what it says. Not as though I had already attained, this is Paul speaking, either were already perfect, but I follow after that I may apprehend that for which I am also apprehended of Christ Jesus. We are seeking, we are looking, we are, we are not aimlessly walking around in this life. We have a goal. We have a goal, and that goal is to be like Christ, to know him and the power of his resurrection. This is our goal, our personal goal as Christians. Yes, there are things that we ought to do. We ought to, as we said, pray and read and study and, and witness to others about Christ, go into all the world and preach the gospels. These are the things that we should do. But on a personal level, we ought to be becoming more like him, to know him. Verse number 13, Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. He has not reached the place. He is saying, listen, I'm not here. I'm not here. I haven't reached anything yet. You are going to be reaching out and moving forward for the entirety of your Christian life. You will never be able to say that you have arrived. There is no graduating class in Christianity. So we are always reaching forward, moving forward. He says, I do not count myself as to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. And here he goes. He says, I press toward, pressing toward is forward motion. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's what we do. We move forward. We press toward the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Even in the Old Testament, even in the Old Testament, we read from Exodus chapter number uh, 14 and verse number 15. Now these words, these words, here's what it says. And the Lord said unto Moses, wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. Go forward. Now he was talking on a spirit, he was talking on a physical level at that point when he was telling the children of Israel not to back up. Move forward. Go ahead. That same thing can be said of us, his children here in the New Testament dispensation. We are to move forward. God is not a backing up God. God is not an about face God. God is a moving forward, press toward the mark God. That's who we are. And so we steadily are moving forward. Amen. So this life is a faith life. This life is a forward life. Next, this life in Christ is a firm life. It is a firm life. In Colossians uh, chapter number two, Colossians chapter number two and verse number seven, it says, root it and built up in him and established. That means that means firm in the faith as you have been taught abounding therein with thanksgiving. You can't forget thanksgiving. You can't forget thanking God for who we are and what he has done for us. But it says here that we ought to be rooted and built up and established, firmly footed in Christ. That means knowing who you are. That means knowing who he is. All of these things will help empower you to battle, to fight against the devil. Because listen, the devil, what he wants from you is your faith. He wants your faith. If he can get your faith, he will stop you in every other area. He will stop your forward motion. He will stop you from being firm if he can knock you off from your faith. If he can get you to... Uh, replace your faith in Christ and put your faith someplace else. If he get you to do this, then he will have won a, a minor victory in your life. I say minor because there are other things that he could do, but he wants your faith first and foremost. Next, this life in Christ, not only is it a firm life and a forward life and a faith life, this life in Christ is a fearless life. It is a fearless life. Why do we say this? Because the Lord tells us over and over again 
that we are not to fear. Second Timothy chapter one and verse number seven. For I have not, for we, God has not given us rather the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We are not to be afraid. Psalm 23 and verse number four. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, what? I will fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. So we have nothing to fear in this life. Now, I know there will be times, there will be circumstances, situations, events. Uh, there will be times that we doubt. There will be time that, the times that we will be unsteady and unsure. I understand all those things. But once again, the stand that we are to have as Christians, as we go through this life, we are to live fearlessly. Fearlessly. Be bold. An old song from the from way back in the day, we used to sing, be bold, be strong, for the Lord thy God is with thee. Do not be afraid. Okay? That's who we are. We live a fearless life. We have nothing to fear. We have all that we need because we serve the God of everything. And so what can, what can come against us? What can come against us? Because we serve God. We serve God. Amen. We now also in this life, we have a, this Christian life is a full life. It is a full life. What do we mean by a full life? Uh, it says in John, let's go to John chapter number 10. John chapter number 10 and verse number 10. It says the thief, the thief cometh come not but to kill, for to kill to steal and to destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Now, when we talk, excuse me, when we talk about abundant life, I want you not to dwell on material things or worldly possessions. This, this is not the pinnacle of what Jesus is speaking about here. This Christian life is not all about, and I fear uh, that much of, not much of, but certain segments of Christianity have morphed themselves into this type of mentality, that the Christian life is about how much you can get, how much you can make, how much you can receive, that God is a giving God, and we do not deny these things. God is a giving God. Uh, we, we serve the God who is the God of the cattle upon a thousand hills. He meets our every need. That's what he does. But we ought not to make material things and worldly possessions the benchmark of our life in Christ, because it is not. It is not. It's not all about that. Unfortunately, uh, certain American brands of Christianity have majored on this aspect of living, how much we can get, how much you can you can amass in this life. And that's, see, that American brand of Christianity will not work in many countries of the world. It won't work. It just won't work. Because if you know the conditions of many parts of the world and how they live, and the money that comes into their respective households and how they go about living their lives, how this has been raised up as being something uh, that we all need to do when we all need to be, it won't. It just won't work. It just will not work. So you are not to dwell on material things and worldly possessions. So when Jesus talks about living uh, an abundant life, an abundant life, first, he's talking about living in the full assurance of who you are and who God is. Living with that assurance. It's also, when we talk about an abundant life, it's knowing that he is our life. Have you, have you come to that conclusion yet? Have you come to that point in your life yet? You see, I'm up in years now. Well, some would say I'm up in years, and let me, let me try to retract that. I don't feel like I'm up in years. I know that the, the white beard shows that there are some years uh, that have come upon me, and this is true, but I don't feel old, and I and I pray I don't I don't behave like an quote old person. However, an old person is supposed to act. Uh, but when we have you gotten to that point in your life where you can say that Christ is your life, 
I know there have been a, a time in my life earlier when Christ was not my life. Christ was a part of my life. Christ was a very major part of my life, but he was not my life. See, when Paul makes that statement, Christ is our life, he, ooh, I don't know, that is so powerful. He says, what he says there is everything is Jesus. Everything is Jesus. That's all I want to hear. That's all I want to know. Jesus is saying right there that, I mean, Paul is saying right there that I have a one-track mind. Now, now once again, we live in a world that has so many different things going on, and we wear different hats, and, and you know, you have to go to school, you have to go to work, you have to do different things, and you can still do all of those things. And you can still do all of those things well, and yet Christ can be your life. Your life. Everything revolves around Jesus and who he is. And that's what Paul is saying here. And that's a life that is abundant. That is an abundant life, knowing that your life is all about him. When Jesus says in John chapter 14 and verse number six, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He says, it's me. He said, it's all about me. I am the life. I am the life. He didn't say, I am a way. I am a truth. I am, I am a life. He did not say that. He was very conclusive and very decisive. He says, I am the way, the truth, the life. That's it. He is exclusive. And that's what he meant uh, when he said this. And so we need to come alongside of these words of Jesus and come alongside of these words in Paul and see our life as totally belonging to him. That is the abundant life. Now, let me give you another aspect of the abundant life. Another aspect of the abundant life is the fact that we hunger and thirst after righteousness. Let me ask you that question. Do you hunger? and thirst after God? Do you want more of him? Not more of church. We need church. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. We need church. But I'm not talking about being in the building. I'm talking about do you want more of him? You see, even if you did not have a building to go to, and some, some, the fact that when churches were closed, uh, the fact that there was no church to go to, it, 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 I am sure, unfortunately, that it knocked many people off of their, uh, off of their routine. What am I going to do now? What am I going to do? You keep serving God. That is what you do. Because our faith, our devotion is not to the church building. Our devotion is to Jesus Christ. So do you hunger and thirst after righteousness? Here's what Jesus says. Here's what the word says, rather, in Psalm 63 and verse 1. We're talking about the fact that this life in Christ is a full life. It is a full life. Psalm 63, verse number 1 says, O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsts for thee. My flesh longs for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. He goes on. Why does he have this longing, this thirsting? He says, to see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. You see, you can serve God beyond the sanctuary. You can live for Christ outside the bounds of the church building. You can. You are supposed to. See, the church life is the church life, the Christian life is not about how many times you are in the building. The, the Christian life is not about how long you spend in the building. As good as the building is, as necessary as the building is, your life in Christ consists of your relationship with Him, whether you are in the building or you are not. You see, the whole church thing, the whole church thing, uh, being in the building. And doing what we do in church, all good, all well. But you can do it, as I always say, you can have church under a tree. You can have church in a park. You can have church anywhere because of what church is. The word church means a gathering, a group of individuals gathered together. 
That's what we are when we come into the edifice that we call the church. Scripture says, don't you know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? And so you are the one that bring the Holy Spirit with you into the building. You see, when, when you're not in the building, when you are not in the building, that building is just a shell. There is no home that can house God. No, no. We bring him with us. I'm talking spiritually. We bring him with us when we come into the building. When we leave the building, when the building is empty, his spirit does not remain in the building. He watches over the building. There may be angels watching over the building uh, in these times, but he dwells in us. Okay? Scripture says he does not dwell in buildings made by hand. He dwells in us, his spirit. And so that is what is most important. And that is living an abundant life, okay? Hungering and thirsting after him. Uh, Matthew chapter five and verse number six. Blessed are they do, who do hunger and thirst after righteousness because they shall be filled. They shall be filled. And so if you want abundance in your life, abundance, real abundance, that has nothing to do with worldly possessions or material things, then seek after God. Seek him. Seek his face. Seek his will. Long for his power. Long for his presence. This is the abundant life that Jesus speaks of in John 10, 10. Amen? And so that is very, very important. Now, we're coming down to the end. This Christian life is also a fellowshipping life, a fellowshipping life. Now, what do we mean uh, by a fellowshipping life? In John chapter one uh, and verse number seven, let's go there real quick. John chapter number one, first John rather, chapter number one and verse number seven. It says, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from every sin. So our fellowship, our fellowship, remember we said this is a fellowshipping life, our fellowship is with one another, and of course, it is with the Lord. First and foremost, our fellowship is with the Lord. You see, if your fellowship with the Lord is not right, then your fellowship with others will not be right either. But if your fellowship with the Lord is right, then your fellowship with your fellow man will be correct also. Okay? So we need to have a proper uh, vertical relationship so that we can have the proper horizontal relationship. Amen? So that's very important. Now, uh, we as the people of God, we have a commonality. We have many things in common with one another. The fact that we are in Christ, the fact that we are new creatures uh, in Christ. Uh, the Bible speaks in uh, 2 uh, Corinthians uh, chapter number 13 and verse number 14, it talks about the fellowship in the spirit. Here's what it says in uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 14, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. The communion of the Holy Ghost. So we have this in common in Philippians chapter number in Philippians chapter number two uh, and verse number one, Philippians two and verse number one. We read. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any uh, bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye may be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. Oh, one accord. Every time I see that phrase, one accord, something happens to me. One accord, we ought to be in one accord. But we're talking about that fellowship in the spirit, that fellowship in the spirit that we should have. There's also another aspect of this 
fellowshipping life that we have in Christ. The fact, and this is the one that is most difficult. We are to, we are a part of the fellowship of his sufferings. Okay, the fellowship of his sufferings. Philippians uh, chapter number three and verse number 10. It says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Now that's what this verse is telling us. That what Christ went through, we go through. We already said when he died, we died. That's how we got in Christ. But how he was treated may be how we are treated. Understand, we are partakers of his sufferings. That doesn't mean that, no, that doesn't mean that you're going to be crucified. That means that, that doesn't mean you're going to die a violent death as Jesus did. And it doesn't mean that. But all who live godly, scripture says, in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Shall go through persecution. That word persecution has to has the idea of being chased down. Somebody chasing you down with bad intentions. With the intent to hurt, to kill, to maim. That's what it means to be persecuted. Everyone who lives godly in Christ Jesus. Not someone who lives in alignment with the world. Not someone who is chummy chummy with the world. But those who live godly in Christ Jesus will. Not may. Not a possibility. Shall. It's a guarantee you're going to suffer persecution. The world will come against you in some way, in some way. The people in your life, whether they be friends, foes, or loved ones, they will come against you in some type of way if you live godly in Christ Jesus. Okay, part part of the badge of who we are. It's part of the Christian life. This is what happens. Amen. Next, this life in Christ is a fresh life. Fresh life. What are you talking about? Well, when we read Romans chapter number six, Romans chapter number six and verse number four, we read these powerful words. Therefore, we are buried with him in baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Newness. There's a freshness that we have in Christ. Remember we said earlier, we are new creations in Christ Jesus. We no longer ought to be walking after the flesh, but we walk now according to the spirit. And this newness of life is both qualitative and quantitative. The quality of our life is greatly enhanced when we receive Christ into our life. And the length of our life is greatly enhanced. When we give our hearts to Christ. What do I mean by that? Of course, we will die. It is appointed unto man once to die and then come judgment. We're talking about spiritually speaking. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We have the promise that we will live forever in Christ. You know, when the rapture comes, he will come and take us away. And the Bible says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. So any way you put it, we are going to live forever with Christ. Amen? So that will be a glorious, glorious day. Finally, finally, this life in Christ is a favor life. A favor life. What does that mean? Grace. Grace. Grace follows us. Grace surrounds us. What is God's grace? God's grace is the goodness of man given to undeserving people. It is God's unmerited, undeserved favor 
toward us. We don't deserve it. By any stretch of the imagination, we don't deserve what we have received from Christ. We don't deserve what we get while we are in Christ. We don't deserve it. But he has come and he has forgiven us and he has forgiven us of our sins. This is the Christian life. These are, and this is the first step. The first step is knowing these truths. And once again, we have not been exhaustive. We cannot exhaust all that the Christian life is. But these, these eight essential qualities will help to enhance and empower your walk with the Lord as you begin walking with him. Let's go over them real quick before we pray. It is a faith life, this life in Christ. It is a faith life. It is a forward life. It is a firm life. It is a fearless life. It is a full life. It is a fellowshipping life. It is a fresh life. And it is a favor life. That's life in Jesus. Oh, yes. And we glory and we honor him and we thank him for giving us the opportunity to live this life. I would not have it any other way. I know where I would be if I was not in Christ. I am quite sure, I am quite sure that had I not given my heart to Jesus way back when I was 15 years old, that I would be long gone, long gone, it is possible that I might have gotten caught up with the things of this world that people do. Many of my friends that I grew up with, not all of them, but a lot of my friends that I grew up with, they're no longer here. But I'm still here. Why? Why am I here when I was there doing the same things that everybody else was doing? Why? Grace. Grace. And so we honor him and we bless him. Now, as you as we continue uh, in our series, uh, when we come together, we're going to continue talking about this life in Christ and just what it is comprised of and exactly how do we go about living the Christian life. I know you get saved, you start going to church. You got to go to church. You got to read your Bible. You got to pray. You got to come to church some more. You have to do all of these things. That's the Christian life. Well, we'll talk about it. And those are, I'm not trying to say those things are not part of the Christian life because they absolutely are. Now we said, we shed a little bit of light on it tonight about faith, but we want to get into the nuts and bolts about how we go about doing this. Amen. How people live and how we should live. Amen. And so that's coming up in the, in the weeks to come in our series. Amen. But tonight, tonight you may be in a difficult place. Tonight, you may be in a place where you just don't understand what's going on in your life. Uh, you may have come to a point in your Christian walk where you are just have more questions than answers. Let me just say that God is able. God is able. He is able to take you where you are. And he is able to give you that calm assurance that he knows that he hears. One thing that we can count on is that God does hear our prayers. We read in the book of Revelation that our prayers go up as incense. Incense. He possesses our prayers. He has them. They are a sweet smelling aroma in his nostrils. So he hears our prayers and he will answer our prayers in his own time and in his own way. So let us remain patient and encourage ourselves in the Lord. What does that mean? Remember who he is. Remember exactly who God is. Remember how he brought peace and 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 judge and 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 encouragement the last time that you went through something. Remember who God is. That's what David did. He he encouraged himself in the Lord. He knew. You read the Psalms. And oh yes, David had his times. David had his times where he did his thing. But David was a man who was a man after God's own heart, his own heart. He knew who his God was way back 
when he was a young man, when he fought against uh, Goliath, he knew who God was. And God was just shaping him then. But he yet had an understanding of who God was. I come to you in the name of the Lord. Uh, of I come to you in the name of the Lord. He knew. We need to take that same word from David. When we're going through it, encourage yourself in the Lord, knowing who he is. He didn't bring you this far to leave you. Let's pray. Lord, we bless your name. Tonight, we honor you. We thank you for who you are. And Lord, I don't know who, who is listening, who is watching at this particular time. But Lord, we know that you are able. Touch that one who is going through a difficult time right now, whether it be uh, mentally, physically, spiritually, uh, however it may be going in their life. Lord, I pray that you will give them that calm assurance, Lord Jesus, that you are there. Lord, there is nothing, uh, there is nothing that can overtake you, Lord Jesus. And everything that they go through now, Lord Jesus, Lord, you have, you, you have allowed it to be, to draw them closer to you, Lord Jesus. So Lord, we pray that you continue to have your way in our hearts. Even as we continue our series next week, Lord willing, uh, Lord, we pray that you once again will give us clarity of mind and clarity of thought. Let us not forget what this life in Christ is all about, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us this full fellowshipping life in you, Lord Jesus. So Lord, have your way and touch that one who is reaching out to you tonight. Save that one who needs to be saved tonight. That one who comes across these words, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray you will lift them up, encourage them even right now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. We bless the Lord. We thank him. We thank him. We honor him uh, for all that he is doing. Amen. And once again, as we said next week, when we come together, uh, we're going to uh, continue. We're going to continue looking at just how we go about living the Christian life. Is it about believing or is it about doing? Amen. We'll touch on that as we move along in our series. Amen. I want to remind you that we have uh, written a book entitled The Lights in the Windows, Eight Basic and Powerful Principles on Evangelism. It is available on Amazon.com. Uh, Amen. Uh, also, our new website will be rolling out very shortly. Uh, once we get there, we'll be offering, we'll be offering uh, several things. And once again, when it is all put together, when it rolls out, uh, we will have uh, give you more information on that. This particular podcast and all of our podcasts are available on several uh, platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iTunes, iHeartRadio, uh, CastBox, and Podcast Addict. Amen. Uh, you can also go to our YouTube channel, which is That's the Word Ministries, and you can become a subscriber to our channel if you have not done so all ready. Amen. And so once again, we praise the Lord and honor him and thank him for all that he is doing. Amen. Continue to pray for us as we continue to pray for you. We thank you for your support. We thank you for all that you have done and are doing. Amen. I'm Pastor Michael Jakes. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Be sure to be with us and look out for our website. We'll let you know when it is up and running. Uh, and until then, we'll see you next time. May God bless you.